In addition to an illustrious career as a, as a well-known trademark and copyright lawyer, John has a unique interest and specialization in 3D printing. Um, and he's a frequent speaker on the issue and even tweets about it and I think has blog entries on it. So now that I know we have a 3D printer here, Marcus, you and I, after this talk, can sit down and, and have a conversation about all the, all the issues that may arise out of uh, using this machine. But I'm very pleased and excited to have John here today. So I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, thanks so much. Molly. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, Yes, I work for, uh, I'm a partner at a law firm, we do work for Noblis, and um, I have been practicing about 30 years, but I have to say that I have not been interested in anything as much as I've gotten interested in 3D printing. Uh, it is the most fascinating and exciting thing that I've done in my entire career. And um, I'm not going to bore you with the law today. I mean, I know it says the future or demise of intellectual property, but it's really high level. You're going to hear very little about the law. Because personally, although I find the legal aspects of this to be very interesting, there's so many other aspects of it that are far more interesting. So this is a really high level presentation. But as I go forward, I want you to think that, I want you to realize that I'm not talking about what should be. I'm talking about what could be. And I'm not making any judgments about what's right or wrong or what could happen or should happen. And also I have to say that the views that I express aren't the views of my firm. And since my words have been quoted against me in litigation, I am going to say that what I say today might not even be my opinion. <laughs> but as I go forward, I want you to keep in mind that 3D printing is starting to tip into the mainstream. It's been around for about 30 years. Some of the earliest patents are starting to expire or have expired. But it's starting to become commonplace. Since the beginning of this year, everybody has been hearing about it. And my prediction is that everything will change when you can make anything. So as I go through this, think about the implications of all of this for your life, your work, uh, your country, and for the world. Now, why do I call it the future or demise of intellectual property? Well, there are really three reasons. One is the democratization of manufacturing. And I'll talk about that as I go through this. The second reason is the open collaboration movement or the maker, maker movement. Anybody heard of the makers? OK. We'll talk about more about them. But the th and there's another reason why I call it the future or demise of intellectual property. And that kind of confirms something I'd, I'd kind of suspected for a long time. Uh, back in uh, May of this year, I wrote an article, I published an article about how uh, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation and the maker movement is using the internet to crowdsource prior art, submitting it to the patent office to try to defeat certain 3D printing related patent applications that are pending. They've done this so far with at least six applications that I know of. So I wrote an article about this. And again, I wasn't making any judgments. But after the article was published, uh, I got some confirmation of what I've suspected for a while. And that is that some people just don't like intellectual property. And there were a lot of comments that were posted in response to the article. And this is one of the kinder ones. In fact, this is probably the kindest one where the, uh, the author said, there's a persistent widespread belief that intellectual property law and patents in particular encourage innovation. This is intuitive. However, the evidence to the contrary is now overwhelming. And the unavoidable conclusion is that intellectual property actually stifles innovation. There's a lot of people out there who believe this. It's a growing belief. If you can't read the inscription on the banana, it says, intellectual property has the shelf life of a banana. <laughs> now, this is a snapshot of the industry. And uh, these are most of the major players above the line. Uh, and I'll talk about some of them a little bit. But um, like 3, 3D Systems, for example, is one of the biggest players. They made this printer right here. Uh, Stratasys is another one. They're both publicly traded companies. 3D Systems is trading around 78 today. Stratasys is around 123. Upper right-hand corner, a company called Arcam out of Sweden, which is traded in the US. It's trading around 134 today. And um, Renishaw, Renishaw makes uh, things mostly in the dental space. And uh, EOS and X1, they're big makers of um, complex machines. Uh, X1 is publicly traded. I think it's around 50-something. Optimec is a private company in New Mexico, which I'll talk about as we go on. Uh, it's doing some exciting stuff. And Organovo is the one that is uh, the bioprinter. It's getting a lot of attention. It's trading around $9 today. 
and then VoxelJet just went public. I'm sorry, they've been public, but they were started being to trade traded on the New York Stock Exchange in October, October 16th, and their stock went from 16 to about 60 over the past uh, month and a half, and right now it's at around uh, 35, I believe. And um, so the the point of this slide is that. Um, you have companies that are what I call below the line. They're the smaller companies, the, ent the entrance into this space. And when they're below the line, they might not care very much about IP. In fact, they might be against IP. They might want everything to be open. The moment they move above that line, intellectual property becomes very important to them. And MakerBot, who you've probably heard of, they're right on the line, you can see. They started out below the line. They were acquired by Stratasys earlier this year. And now they are moving up into the stratosphere of the 3D printing world and they, uh, now they care, they will care very much about intellectual property. Now where is the IP in 3D printing? I, I don't know how much you know about 3D printing. We have one right here. Basically it's, you know, 3D printing is also referred to as additive manufacturing as, to, as distinguished from subtractive manufacturing, traditional methods where you drilled or milled some piece of metal or plastic to get a finished result additive manufacturing starts with nothing and makes something and you have additive manufacturing machines like this that are driven by software or firmware and they use a CAD file and then a computer aided manufacturing program that will fuse something layer on layer I know this is broken already I didn't break it they will fuse something layer on layer <coughs> from an extruded material or from a powder or even from sheets of paper. MCOR makes a company that uh, MCOR is a company that makes a printer that uses sheets of paper, and then it will it will bind these layers with either uh, heat or chemical or glue or electron beams uh, or um, adhesives, and until you get a finished product. After it comes out of the printer, you can probably see from the ones the examples that are being passed around. They're, they're, they may not be very refined. They might need some post-processing, uh, either sanding, polishing, heat treating, sintering, removal of support structures, maybe painting. Uh, and there's IP at every step along the way here. Every th and, and so there's a lot of opportunity for companies to get into this space, in the software, in the hardware, in the 3D printers themselves, in the materials, in the post-production processing. Now why do I say that 3D printing may change everything. Well, first of all, on the micro level, one machine can make the entire product. You've probably seen some examples of this uh, where you can print an entire product as one. And I'll, ha I'll show you some examples on the screen as we go on. You don't have to have any tooling. You don't have to have any retooling. So you only need one machine to make the whole thing, whatever the thing happens to be. You can make impossible designs or things that were difficult to make before, such as nonlinear holes. Nonlinear holes could all only be made before by casting. Honeycomb structures, very difficult to make in any other way. Uh, uh, materials that have variable wall thicknesses, or materials that are partially porous and partially solid, that's especially important for things that are going to be implanted into the body, because the tissue will, bind, will um, connect itself better to materials that are partially porous. So you have the ability to make things that you weren't able to make before. And also customization is free. And making something that's complex is free. It's no more expensive to make a complex thing with a 3D printer than it is to make a simple thing with a 3D printer. It just depends upon the design, the input. And it's no more expensive to make one than it is to make a thousand. And it's also greener because it's additive. It's using less material and also You'll, as you'll see as we go on, 3D printing lends itself to being done where the product is going to be used and needed. And therefore, it's greener in the sense that shipping may not be required, or there would be less shipping involved. However, on the macro level, you have two facially inconsistent situations. One is that 3D printing could cause a manufacturing renaissance in countries that have high intellectual capital but high manufacturing costs, like the US, the UK, Japan, Australia. You hear in all of these countries that they're farming out jobs. They're going, the jobs are going offshore. So there's a chance of bringing uh, jobs back into all of these countries and, uh, because there's no real advantage to offshoring. It makes sense to 3D print things where they are needed. But the other facially inconsistent situation is that it could cause the disruption of all kinds of traditional 
models, manufacturing, warehousing, shipping, retail, distribution, all of these could be disrupted. And, and jobs could be lost. The future sales may not be of products, they may be of designs. And they may be printed where they're needed. Now, people say, well, this is going to cause the loss of jobs. <coughs> but the analogy that I draw is to the horse. Think about the horse. When we had the horse as our major form of transportation, we had uh, saddle makers, and we had uh, blacksmiths, and we had wagon makers, we had wagon wheel makers, we had people who took care of the horses, we had people who built stables. And when the, when the automobile came along, all of those jobs were lost. But think of all of the new jobs that were created by the automobile industry. Jobs that nobody knew would exist or could exist until the automobile came along. The same thing is true of 3D printing. So I think we'll see, see disruption of jobs, disruption of traditional business models, and maybe the loss of jobs but also the creation of jobs and the ability to bring things home. The world may get smaller through 3D printing because it makes sense to make things where they are needed. And where the disruption could occur is in uh, far off lands where a lot of things are made now. They may not, we may not have the same need to have things manufactured in far off lands when we can make them right here at home. Now let's th do a thought, experience, a thought experiment. What would it be like if anyone could make things with virtually any functionality away from control? And this is a, fr this is a phrase, away from control, that, that I've been using. And away from control basically means that you get a file on a peer-to-peer -peer basis so that you have it, nobody knows you have it, or maybe you create a file and you share it that way. Or maybe it's something that you can get on the black market Nobody knows you have it or that you got it. Or maybe it's something that you get from Pirate Bay, which is kind of like the black market. You've probably heard of Cody Wilson. Cody Wilson is the guy who 3D printed the gun. And uh, he isn't a gun guy. I, I heard him speak in New York. I asked him some questions. And he's a little bit difficult to understand, but his thing isn't about guns. His thing is about what would it be like if you could make something Nobody knew you made it, and nobody could do anything about it. Nobody could control it. And that's what I call making things away from control. So he's, he's, he used the gun as an example. He happened to come up with the gun as an example. It's a good example to show what would the implications be of being able to make anything away from control. But as I go forward throughout this presentation, think about what the ability to make a product, a thing, a virtually any functionality away from control how would that affect traditional business models? And how would it affect intellectual property? Well, I think there would be a paradigm shift. We would shift to a situation where there's a complete democratization of manufacturing. If you're able to make anything, of virtually any functionality, away from control, basically manufacturing has been democratized. There would be no entry barriers to being able to make things. The lines would blur between manufacturers and retailers and users. And you could have fundamentally different products. Right now, this, you know, the smartphone, it looks like this for two reasons. One, because Steve Jobs said it would look like this. And the other reason is because traditional manufacturing methods and materials dictate what the phone is going to look and feel like. But if you can 3D print something, and we'll talk about materials and methods that might be used to do that, it doesn't have to look like this. It could be fundamentally different in look and feel. It only needs to do what this does. So when you think about whether you could possibly make one of these at home, the answer might be no. It might not look anything like this. But it might do what this does. Now, my thesis is that as democratization of manufacturing increases, intellectual property becomes less relevant. Less relevant. And I'll explain why as we go on. So what I've done is I've created a checklist for IP, what I call IP disruption. And first of all, on the industrial level, you need two things to be able to have this disruption. You need to be able to make big things. This, this doesn't make very big things. Right? But on the industrial level, you need to make, be able to make big things. You also need to be able to make them fast, or you need to be able to make a lot of them. Then on either the industrial level or on the home level, you need hybrid materials, materials that can do what you need them to do so that when you print something out on a printer like this, you might only have one feedstock or maybe you have a couple of feedstocks, but their, 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 um, their characteristics can be changed as you print 
so that you get the characteristics that you need in the finished product. You also need the ability to print complex structures. And when I say complex structures, I mean integrated structures such as a smartphone. You need to be able to do that if you're going to be able to make anything away from control uh, of any functionality. And you need to be able to make really small things because you need to be able to print the circuitry that goes inside. This company called Camtech that announced just uh, a week and a half ago that they're introducing a printer that can do that in um, early 2014. And it's publicly traded around 550 today. Uh, you also need to have hybrid machines, machines that can do the things that 3D printers can't do. I mentioned the post-production processes. Uh, and, and there might be instances where you want to have some additive manufacturing process along with a subtractive manufacturing process. You need hy hybrid machines. And then you need innovators. And these are the innovators of tomorrow. These are the people that are going to do all of these things. And you need one other thing to be able to disrupt IP completely, and that is the ability to do all of these things away from control. All right, so let's see where we are today. Most of the market for 3D printing up until now, about 70% of it, has been for rapid prototyping. It shortens the development life cycle and makes it easier to get a product to market. You can, do, you can change the design easily. You can print it out over and over again. It saves cost. You can make just one of something. And you have some increased confidence in what the final product is going to look like because you can prototype it so easily. But there's a growing uh, use of 3D printers for industrial purposes. Uh, and about 50% of all printers that are being sold today are being used for uh, final production of parts. There's been about a 28% increase in the use of printers for production parts uh, within the last year. And the hot areas, of course, which probably everybody's heard are aerospace, automotive, healthcare, uh, fashion. And you know, fashion's particularly important. I, my, my wife, in particular, is very happy that, that 3D printing offers the possibility for an endless supply of cool shoes, such as the pair that you see on the screen that were 3D printed. And then complex structures. Now, in uh, aerospace, Boeing recently said, this is the ultimate manufacturing method for us. And uh, Boeing has been uh, 3D printing since 1992. They have been flying 3D printed parts since 2002. And they fly 22,000 3D printed parts. And they're particularly proud of this air duct that's in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. Uh, it used to be printed as, uh, I think, 15 different parts. Now it's printed as one, which, re which reduces inventory, makes it easier to install, easier to service. It weighs less, uh, and uh, it eliminates other problems like tolerance stacking if you're putting a bunch of pieces together. And ultimately, it reduces aircraft weight, which cuts back on the need for fuel, and ultimately makes your airline ticket cheaper. Airbus uh, ha has 3D printed this wing bracket that's in the foreground of the center photo. Uh, it, um, you can see it looks a lot different from the traditionally manufactured wing bracket that's in the background. The one in the background was made through 14 or 15 different steps. That's 14 or 15 different machines with at least 14 or 15 different operators. Doesn't make sense to do that in the US. The one in the foreground was made in one step in one machine. Makes sense to do that anywhere. One operator. China has printed this titanium wing spar. And uh, there have been some other advances made by GE. GE is very big into this space. Uh, they say this is the future of manufacturing. And they acquired a company called Morris Technologies and its sister company uh, that are 3D printing companies. They're doing this in-house. They're not like, H, uh, like um, HP that says they want to sell a printer. GE wants to just do it in-house. And um, they're going to make uh, 4,000 parts for the leading edge aircraft propulsion engine. I read this morning that they're going to make 86,000 um, fuel nozzles with what's called direct uh, metal laser sintering. And they expect to save 1,000 pounds from a 6,000 pound engine from 3D printing. Think about that. Rolls-Royce has the Mer Merlin project with six manufacturers to uh, make an engine. And then there's the, the automotive field. And uh, Ford and I, I think virtually all of the car manufacturers are using 3D printing for prototyping and to, to some extent for manufacturing. 
Uh, BMW has made some ergonomic tools that make it easier for people to use them on the production line. And then what we have what, what I call the three cool cars. Uh, in the lower left corner is the Orion. It's a, uh, the first 3D printed Formula One race car. It was designed by uh, 15 uh, design students in Belgium. And in the upper right is uh, the uh, DARPA crowd-derived combat support vehicle design challenge winner 2011, which was made by Local Motors. Anybody heard of Local Motors? Local Motors crowdsources uh, automotive design and you can go build your own car with them. Uh, and then in the bottom right is um, Ast uh, James Bond's Aston Martin DB5, three of which were printed by Voxeljet. That's the company that I said we started to trade on the New York Stock Exchange in October. They're in Germany and they have they can make big things, like the DB5. Three of these were printed for Skyfall. And you say they printed the car. They printed everything in this car, including tires? This is just the body. Just the body? Mm -hmm. Now, where I think we'll see, or where you may see, the, the greatest advance or the greatest uh, benefit uh, that might directly relate to your life in the shortest term, the nearest term, is in healthcare. There's so many things going on in, in healthcare. Uh, the uh, Wake Forest Center for Regenerative Medicine has printed fingers and ears and noses and um, uh, virtually all Invisalign braces are 3D printed. There have been 17 million of them. Invisalign just has rooms full of 3D printers that do this. There's a uh, university in Scotland that's working on 3D printing of stem cells. Imagine, imagine if you could 3D print stem cells and eliminate the controversy around stem cells, what the benefit there would be. Uh, Organovo is working on 3D printing of uh, liver tissue, and, they, and they've, they've done it, uh, where they've kept uh, liver tissue alive for 30, 40 days. It will be used in drug testing, so it has the potential of eliminating animal testing altogether. Uh, I mean, many of you may know this, but if you, when you do animal testing, you may spend all this money testing a drug on an animal, and it, it, it's working just great. And then next step is to go into humans, and then the moment it gets into human liver, it doesn't work or it's toxic, you have to start all over again. So being able to 3D print liver tissue offers the possibility of skipping that animal step and that cost and the time that it takes. And uh, I saw just this past week there's uh, some advances being made in the 3D printing of uh, skin. I saw an amazing, amazing photo of a facial reconstruction. And 95% uh, of all hearing aid shells are 3D printed today. And this is my favorite. This is a proof of concept, uh, customizable artificial heart. And uh, I'd like you to meet the inventor. This is Baxter Eldridge. Uh, I think he's in junior high school, uh, somewhere in California. In healthcare, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, in uh, fashion, it's not just shoes. Uh, there's a company called Shapeways that 3D printed this, um, this dress. The entire dress was 3D printed. And uh, uh, I always say when I give this speech that if we, if we could 3D print this, these, you know, you would be selling a whole lot more 3D printers. And of course, I'm referring to the, the bracelet and the speakers there. Uh, but I will say that certain parts of her anatomy are being 3D printed and should have been on the healthcare slide. <laughs> now, this is maybe the most important slide in the presentation. And this is about the 3D printing of complex structures. Optimac, that's the company in New Mexico that I mentioned that's, that's privately held. Along with Stratasys, that's one of the two, two biggest players in the industry that is publicly traded. Together they printed this uh, little drone in the upper right hand corner. And it was printed as one. Electronics and shell, printed as one. First fully 3D printed electromechanical structure. This was about, uh, it was earlier this year. Optimec has also been doing work in 3D printing an antennas, and Harvard has uh, Harvard and University of Illinois have 3D printed this battery that is um, it's a lithium-ion battery that's uh, 300 microns. And Disney's working on interactive toys. And just um, I think it was last week or so, it was after I prepared these slides. Um, 3D Systems and uh, Motorola Mobility announced that they're working on a project <laughs> together to. Uh, do 3D printing of modular smartphones so that together using both uh, additive and subtractive manufacturing processes they want to 
3D print an entire smartphone. So that's step one, doing it on industrial level. Step two would be able to do it at home. And we'll, get, we'll talk about that more as I go on. So what are the IP implications for all of this? First of all, all of these companies, automotive and aerospace, they love IP, as I mentioned before. If, they're above, if you're above that line, you're going to love IP. And all of this stuff, it's protectable. There have been 12,000 patent applications filed in the, in the uh, 3D printing space, and I show a shark here to represent us protecting those patent applications, lawyers. And uh, there's going to be all kinds of infringement that come out of this, patent infringement and trade secret infringement and copyright infringement involving software and designs. And the likelihood of that happening is pretty high. But justice will be done. Uh, but I think the scope of this is going to be like the cell phone wars. Everybody's heard of the cell phone wars. I think we're going to see the 3D printing patent wars, just like we saw the cell phone patent wars. Now, what's the risk to the IP system? It depends on the degree of democratization of manufacturing. Probably there won't be any big risk to the um, aerospace industry because people aren't going to be probably 3D printing things away from control that would go into an aircraft. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe that would be true in the healthcare field, too. People aren't going to be 3D printing their own livers, for example. But uh, there's a book, a uh, bestseller, actually, called Fabricated that was written by a professor at Cornell named Hod Lipson. And uh, in, the, um, in the preface or the introduction, he has this um, scenario of what it will be like in, um, say, some distance uh, in years from now. Maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 20 years. And he, he, he runs this, through this scenario of how black market organs have become such a problem. And such, there's such a problem that someone actually went to the trouble of creating this graphic that I found on the internet where you'll be able to buy 3D printed organs in the local grocer's case. So that brings us to materials. Materials, this is a golden age for materials. It's a golden age for material scientists. Wohlers, who is a consulting firm that uh, studies the 3D printing industry, believes there will be enormous growth in the materials segment in the coming years. I've been asked to come give this speech for chemical companies that want to see how they can get into this area. And, you know, you have all of the uh, usual suspects of um, uh, materials. This uses PLA, plastic. Uh, there is also, um, uh, if you work at Google, I didn't see back here in your, in your cafeteria, but at Google you can 3D print any pasta that you want um, uh, for lunch. And uh, there's 3D printing being done of glass and ceramic and, uh, and even wood filament. Uh, but the, there are all other materials they call the Star Trek materials. NC State University has a, uh, uh, an alloy that is a metal that's liquid at room temperature. So uh, think about the, a time in the future when you might be able to print some complex structure at home. Well, somebody might say, well, you know, there's going to have to be a lot of heat involved, and that's not going to be safe. So we'll never be able to do that at home. But imagine if you could print the metal that's needed in the circuitry of this device at home without any heat because the liquid is, is I'm sorry, the metal is liquid at room temperature. This uh, alloy of gallium and indium is self-healing both mechanically and electrically. University of Glasgow is developing organic compounds that can be 3D printed uh, where they're needed, so you can print uh, drugs, for example, where they are needed. Don't have to worry about shipping and um, refrigeration. And uh, Cambridge University and the Palo Alto Research Center have both been working on the uh, 3D printing of thin film transistors. And the University of Warwick has developed this material called Carbomorph. Carbomorph is uh, conductive when you need it to be conductive and non-conductive when you don't need it to be conductive and they've 3D printed this game controller as one, functioning game controller as one. So that's, a, that's the insides and the outsides printed as one. Then there's this, this is my, one of my favorites, this was announced just recently. The Ames Research Laboratory and NASA uh, have announced the project. This is the real name of the project, Biomaterials Out of Thin Air in situ on-demand printing of advanced biocomposites. And the idea is that they want to take molecules from the surrounding environment, manipulate them, and print from them where you need them and what you want from them. Something from nothing. Uh, there are a lot of people working on bone material and that, that have actually uh, 
uh, 3D printed bone material, and uh, there are a lot of other uh, organizations, companies that are making implants. Uh, 3D printed implants are great because they fix to the body perfectly. And then there's graphene. Anybody familiar with graphene? Graphene. Graphene is uh, one atom thick layer of mineralized graphite. Three million layers of graphene is one millimeter thick. A sheet of graphene, the thickness of a sheet of plastic wrap, can support the weight of an elephant. Maybe not standing on a pencil, but the weight of an elephant nevertheless. It's two time, 200 times stronger than steel, and it's transparent and conductive. So imagine the possibilities of this material. Uh, the uh, European Union has announced what they call the graphene flagship, where 17 countries and 75 partners are participating in development, research and development in this area. And just last week, uh, a company in Canada called Lumico Metals uh, entered into a relationship with a New York company called um, Graphene Laboratories to form a company called Graphene 3D Laboratories, and that's what they're going to work on, graphene for 3D printing. Then there's the AMAZE project. This was just also recently announced by the European Space Agency and 28 other participants, uh, and their, their goal is to 3D print materials for spacecraft and nuclear fusion that can withstand 3,000 degrees centigrade. The Palo Alto Research Lab is also uh, working on something they call chiplets, and chiplets are basically the size of grains of sand, but they're smart materials. Uh, for example, a chiplet could contain uh, microprocessors, microvalves, photovoltaics, uh, whatever you happen to need, and then you bring them together in whatever configuration you need, you print them so you can print smart things from smart ingredients. And voxels are basically the same thing except on a much more conceptual level. Then there's what I call Star Trek materials. This is a uh, U.S. Army project with um, Harvard and University of Pittsburgh. This, you can read what, what they say in this project, what, what they, how they describe it. Basically, they are going to do uh, ma creating materials for shape-shifting morphing. Materials that can start as one thing and be morphed into whatever they need to be so that if you make a product, uh, a simple example would be um, a uniform, a military uniform that is, uh, has the properties it needs for cold weather when it's cold and hot weather, hot weather when it's hot. Same IP implications for all of this technology except I think the risks to the IP system are probably lower because there's probably a lower risk of democratization of manufacturing complex materials. There's a lot of manufacturing going on uh, in small companies of simple materials, but the complex materials, we probably won't see a lot of democ democratization of manufacturing. So let's talk a little bit about 3D printing away from, away from control. And at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas in 2013, 3D printers were the rage. And everyone is starting to realize that with a 3D printer, anyone can make, eventually, make virtually anything uh, and bypass traditional manufacturing chains or supply chains. And if you own a Microsoft Connect, uh, you can scan something today, and because there's software that will uh, allow you to adopt your Connect to be used as a 3D scanner. There's a lot of 3D scanners out on the market. And what's important about the technology right now is that for early adopters, uh, the, the, the products that come out of a machine like this only need to be good enough. It's just the same as it was with computers in the early days. The, the uh, early computers, they didn't have to be great. They, the technologies just needed to be good enough. And that's true with a lot of uh, new products. The early adopters don't think they have to be great. Products don't have to be great. They just have to be good enough for now. There's also the maker movement that I mentioned earlier, which is an open manufacturing, open innovation movement. They're able to crowdsource designs much faster. That uh, DARPA uh, combat support vehicle I showed you earlier was, um, the, the design of it was crowdsourced in a fifth the time that it takes a, uh, a, a traditional car manufacturer to do the same thing. And the makers don't like intellectual property. And they analogize the intellectual property system to Encyclopedia Britannica. Encyclopedia Britannica was a closed system. Wikipedia is an open system. Britannica's gone, and they believe the same thing will happen to IP because IP is a closed system. We also have the RepRap printer. The RepRap printer is a, an open source 3D printer that makes itself. It's designed to make more RepRap printers, and there are about 20,000 of them in the world, and I, it always reminds me of Terminator 3. 
you know, the rise of the machines. We, we just hope eventually they won't become self-aware. Now, the experts say that uh, in the near term, uh, most of the growth in the 3D printing space is going to be in the industrial area, uh, not in the home area. They also say that most homes will not have a 3D printer anytime soon. And they also say that the printers that will be in the homes will be relatively unsophisticated. And I think they're wrong. And one of the reasons I think they're wrong, I mean, you can see this, this machine working. Uh, I have another example here. This is the um, Cube printer. It's made by the same company as this one. Uh, this printer costs about $1,299. Uh, it's being sold in Staples and Sky Mall and uh, this one costs about, I think this one costs about $3,000. Yeah. And um, I can't imagine what parent or what kid isn't going to want one of these real soon. Uh, also, we're starting to see 3D printers in UPS stores. They, they have a relationship with Stratasys. Uh, Staples also has MCOR machines in their stores. Those are uh, the ones that print paper. They're great for making uh, full color models. Um, and there's other, other printers out there on the market that cost a whole lot less than this. Some people say, well, the, the problem is it's $1,299. People are going to spend that much money. I, I live in the Washington area. I see people spending that kind of money all the time for other things in their homes. But you can buy a 3D printer for four or $500 from some of the companies that were below the line. Uh, DC Public Library has a couple of them, uh, and you can go there, and they will print things for you. You can't actually use them yourself yet. I think that time will come. I don't know whether there are any in this area. Uh, there probably are. More and more libraries are getting them. First Apple II cost $1,000. First Apple II cost $1,000. Yeah, so it's, it, and that was, that was probably 1978. 1978. You spent $1,000. So I, when people say that people won't, when, when the experts say that people won't spend $1,200 for one of these printers. I, th I say, what, what world are you living in? Uh, now, there is one expert who isn't wrong, and that's Avi Rickenstall. He is the uh, CEO of 3D Systems, and he says, we live in exponential times. So all of these things, everything happens faster today than they used to happen. And there's another expert, this guy named Andy Bird, who works for this company we've probably heard of. He says everybody's going to have a 3D printer within about 10 years. Now, I think the experts are also wrong because of Company X. I don't know who Company X is yet. It could be a company that already exists. It could be a company that doesn't exist yet. But Company X is going to want to sell you a printer that can print anything. It'll start off simple. I mean, th this, this machine can't print anything. But Company X will come out with a printer in the not too distant future that will be able to print complex structures. And those will get better and better over time. And they'll get better and better faster and faster, just like computers have. So why will this rock the intellectual property world? As you can see, 3D printing cuts across all types of IP. I'm, I'm sorry, all types of technology. It also cuts across all types of IP. Anybody can basically make anything. And away from control, infringement will proliferate. And we have different, modes, different uh, schools of thought. First of all, we have the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution says, the Congress shall have the power to promote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. On the other hand, we have the makers who believe that intellectual property is actually killing innovation. And we've seen this, we've seen this happen before. The, uh, back in the 80s, uh, the movie industry fought the VCR. And today, uh, we see how the internet has been changing the music industry. And the internet together with 3D printing are a very powerful tool for avoiding or disrupting intellectual property. So I've, I've, I've come up with what I call the five I's for the major disruption of intellectual property models. As, as it becomes possible to make anything away from control, infringement will become more and more common. As infringement becomes more common, it will become more and more difficult to identify because nobody will know that you're infringing in your garage or in your basement. At that point, it becomes impractical or impossible to enforce intellectual property, and at that point, IP becomes irrelevant. But that's a small issue, I think. I think the bigger issue is why would anybody buy a branded product at all if they can make a generic product at home? So, for example, you, 
It, it could be something as simple as, a, as a, uh, a dump truck for your kid. You could spend the money on a, a Tonka truck, but if you can print out a generic truck at home, why do you need to buy a Tonka truck, and therefore why does Tonka have a business of selling trucks? That's a medium-sized issue. The really big issue is the potential disruption of uh, mass production. Now, many people will say that 3D printing can never compete with mass production. It will never be as fast. You'll never be able to print as many things as you can make with other mass production methods. And that may be true. But right now, companies that don't have any IP protection get some protection through economies of scale. For example, consider a dinner plate. You have plates at home. You have service for 8 or 12, something like that. And you break a plate. You need another plate. Well, if you can 3D print that plate, then you, buy, you make that plate, you, have, you can make one. If you can make one, you can make eight. If you can make eight, you don't need the mass producer. So the mass producer who 3D printing will never compete with may be disrupted by the fact that you and you and you and you and you all will make your own plates when you need them or have the ability to do so. So if we have the, so if we have the disruption of mass production through 3D printing, then mass production may become uh, reduced in its importance, reduced in its in effect. Now, let's look at the big picture. We've had four disruptive game changers over the course of human, human, hum, humankind. The first was fire. That was a very important one. Everybody knows about that. And then there was the wheel. If it weren't for the wheel, we would have all had to walk here today, right? And then there was the industrial revolution, and then the digital revolution, and uh, this is a, an example of an early Apple ad. It said, here's what you can do with this Apple computer. You can create dazzling color displays. You can, you can create your own Pong games. That was the best they could think of, of what you could do with the computer at that time. This was 1977. It's the best they could think of. Right? They, didn't, they had these things they called computers, but they didn't know what to do with them. And people are asking the same thing today. I, ha I hear it at every conference. What do I actually do with this thing? Well, it's the innovators I showed you earlier, the kids. They're going to figure that out. First spreadsheet was on an app. First spreadsheet was on an app. OK. Yeah, so, but I think when they first came out with the Apple, they didn't realize that the spreadsheet would become so important, right? The founder of IBM said there's only a need for five computers. The founder, one of the co-founders of Digital Equipment Corporation said there's no reason anybody would ever have a computer in their home. In 1994, I, got a, I was out at lunch, and I got, when I got back, I had a phone message from a reporter at the Washington Post who left a phone message that said, if someone registers someone else's trademark on the, on the internet as, as a domain name on the internet, would that infringe the trademark? And so the very first thing I did is I called our library and I said, what is the internet? This is 1994. And then the very next thing I did is I, I, I asked, well, what is a domain name? I had no idea. Well, now everybody knows what they are today. It wasn't that long ago. And it wasn't that long ago that I was asking, why do I need one of these? What am I going to do with it? Now I can't live without it. So with 3D printing, all of the same questions are being answered. And there's a lot of speculation right now. There's a lot of hype. You see a lot of hype. I'm not saying you'll be able to print one of these tomorrow. But I think eventually you will. But the elements are starting to fall into place. And so let's go back to the checklist. We saw that you can make big things. Uh, we also. And uh, we also saw that, no, actually I didn't mention this earlier, but in the, on the uh, issue of speed or scale, there's a comp uh, Loughborough University is doing something called high speed centering that they say can compete with the speed of, um, of uh, injection molding. Uh, 3D Systems announced in uh, Germany this morning that they are introducing two new printers that are seven and 10 times faster than uh, their prior printers. So there are being great advances made um, with both speed and scale. We saw, with respect to hybrid materials, that we have carbomorph and uh, graphene and chiplets and uh, voxels. Uh, we also saw the ability to print complex structures. I didn't mention this ear that's in the bottom, which was printed by Princeton University. It's a bionic ear. Uh, it is made with human tissue and electronics. So it's not a cosmetic ear, it's a bionic ear. Uh, we also have microscale printing. And um, 
I mentioned Camtech that's coming out with a printer uh, early next year that will be able to print uh, integrated circuits. And we have hybrid machines. This is one example of a company called Murata Industries that uh, combines 3, 3D printer with a, um, a CNC router. And we have plenty of innovators. And as you can see, the sales of personal printers have been growing geometrically over the last few years. But to be able to have this total disruption of IP that I've mentioned before, we need to have one more thing, and that's the ability to do all of these things away from control. And we don't have that yet, but it's coming. And one of the reasons it's coming is the uh, disarming corruptor. I just found out about this a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you recognize that, that little fellow in the, uh, in the image there. But the disarming corruptor is a computer program that will probably go viral and what it does is it's, it disguises 3D printing files. So it could be a file that's covered by IP, some kind of IP, copyright, or maybe it's, it even has patents on the end product. Or it could be a product that's dangerous, like a gun. Philadelphia, or was it, it's either Pennsylvania or Philadelphia just, just last week, I think, enacted some law that says that it's illegal to 3D print, a, 3D print a gun. And other states will do that too. But the, the laws will mean nothing because of the disarming corruptor. If you have uh, the parts or the design for a gun, they're disguised by the, 3D pr by, the, by the disarming corruptor, then they can be printed by any printer. And the, by the way, the passwords for the, uh, the encrypted files are just shared by email. So welcome to the revolution. We're reaching the tipping point. Uh, and in 2011, 80,000 printers were sold. And um, What's going to happen is that uh, businesses are going to have to evolve in this space or they're going to die, but there'll be a lot of new companies that are created, new, new, new types of jobs, and it's happening very quickly. You've also probably heard of America Makes. It was uh, formerly known as the uh, National Additive Manufacturing Innovation Institute. Uh, the president mentioned it during his State of the Union address in January. He didn't mention the institute, but he did mention a factory in Youngstown, Ohio that was being reopened, and that's where... Na that's where this institute is located. And uh, they've recently changed their name to America Makes. And uh, they're serious in signing up companies, universities to um, work together in this space. And there are major initiatives in the 3D printing space in other countries. UK is making a major push. Uh, Japan has a, a joint project between government and industry to work on 3D printing of metals. China has some 25, I think, uh, 3D printing innovation institutes. And I have to say that most countries that are serious about this are putting a lot more money into it than we are. But uh, it is a growing industry. The, com the uh, a compound annual growth rate, as you can see, has gone from uh, a couple billion dollars in 2002, 2012, uh, and it's expected to be about 10, 11 billion dollars uh, by 2021. So, this is my vision for where we're going to be in a few years. There's two sides to 3D printing, as I mentioned. There's the within control side, that's the industrial side, or, or, or this side right here, where everyone can see what's happening and it can be controlled. And then there's the away from control side. On the within control side, I think we're going to start to see multifunction machines do whatever they need to do on industrial scale. They'll be able to print virtually any functionality. We'll see radically different look and feel to products. They don't have to look anything like they look now. They don't have to feel anything like they look now. They just need to do what the product needs to do. Additive manufacturing will not replace subtractive manufacturing. It will complement it. They'll work together. We will see in the not too distant future a 3D printer in every classroom and MakerBot is working on a project to do just that. And I think we'll see flourishing economies because of it. On the away from control side, we'll have the ability to print any design anytime. We'll be able to use our eye factories in our homes. And they'll be in every home. And we'll be able to print any functionality. And it'll be as easy as making a loaf of bread in a bread maker. And the result of that is that IP will become increasingly irrelevant. How long will it take? Well, Bill Gates said that we underestimate things that will happen in 10 years and we overestimate things that will happen in two. And he certainly probably underestimated what his future would be like when this photo was taken in Albuquerque in 1977. 
But my prediction is that in roughly 10 to 12 years, we'll have all of the things that were in my vision. So as I said at the beginning of this presentation, everything will change when you can make anything. But intellectual property, it's not quite dead yet. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming. And follow my tweets. I tweet on 3D printing every day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Control, the question is, what are the possibility of control of materials? Right. Well, certainly, I think that uh, to the extent that the creation and manufacturing of materials is not democratized, meaning that it's uh, within industry, within, company, within companies, certainly I think that can be controlled. Uh, local or state or federal uh, authorities can um, uh, make whatever laws need to be made for the materials, and uh, the companies themselves can control the materials. So I don't think that it will be difficult to control materials uh, on an industrial level. But um, there, there is work being done uh, that will, um, to, to have printers that would be able to create the material they need from other materials. In other words, materials that can have a basic input material that we, we don't know what it is, but it can be manipulated on a molecular level. And if you can do that, then there's really no way to regulate what might be done with that material away from control. Okay? Yes, sir. You're arguing that once you can print things away from control, the IP becomes irrelevant. How is it different from software? You can install things away from control, but software IP protections, I mean, there's quite a, quite a bit of piracy, but the IP mm -hmm. protection still exists for software. Yes, the question is, what's the difference between this and software? Well, uh, I've never said that IP will go away. There will always be a place for it. There'll be a place for it in the within control world. But to the extent that uh, software or the machines or the materials or whatever allow you, and the advancement in the technology allow you to uh, make anything in a place, in a way that no one knows what you're doing, then the IP is really irrelevant. It's still there. You're infringing. You may very well be infringing. But nobody knows about it, so it becomes irrelevant. But, but it can like full garden systems like an app store and uh, you know, if, if Apple made a three D printer that you could only print things that came from their app store mm -hmm. and people would publish their I mean there's ways to protect it, um, even though information wants to be free. And then you can jailbreak the printer. <laughs> Right, you can jailbreak. I mean, you, you, these designs, you know, I think it'll happen first with things like toys, for example. Uh, on one of the earlier screens, there were some examples of Star Trek figurines. And right now, you can go to, if you go to Disney World, you can have your daughter 3D printed, or, you know, an image of her, a figurine of her 3D printed as uh, Cinderella. And they'll ship it to you, right? And you can do the same thing with carbon freeze from uh, Star Wars. You can have yourself carbon frozen, and they'll ship you that. Uh, and right now, they're selling those. They're making money. But all you need to do is scan one, create the file, share it on the Internet, peer-to-peer. -peer. Everybody can have access to it. So the ability to make that at home now is something that you can do. And uh, so where does the market for selling those uh, go? It disappears. Gradually, it disappears. So, you know, it's true that there will always be people who will always want to buy the product. But I think over time, uh, as the technology level increases, the quality increases, you'll be able to print more and more things and eventually people might say, well, you know, I don't need to go buy that. I can just print it. As, if it's as easy as using a bread maker, you'll be able to do that. Anybody else? Yes? To me, it's more a question of how IP can evolve because I, I had the same thought about software mm -hmm. where it's basically the technical problems um, to do a lot of things have been solved and then, you know, from a lot of people's perspective, it seems like IP issues are getting in the way because I ought to be able to say go pay some some reasonable amount to just find any movie that's been produced and download it off the internet and instead you know licensing issues and whatever make it difficult to do that in a legal manner um, I'm just I'm just wondering if you see a path for IP to move in a direction where it's sort of acknowledging you know things are free that didn't used to be free and people fundamentally are noticing, hey, you're trying to charge for something that technically there doesn't need to be any charge for. 
Well, I think 3D, I mean, IP, IP certainly will evolve. I mean, some people say, well, we're going to have to have more regulation, more laws. I, my prediction is that IP laws will become narrower over time, not broader. Uh, it will just be, you, you can try to regulate things. There's always, government always wants to try to regulate, but I think the ability to regulate will be diminished as the ability to make virtually anything away from control increases. Yes, sir. I think it's about quality. For example, I can buy project, project management tool, mm -hmm. and there's a number of them on the market that are free, but they're all crap. Or I can pay $300 and I can buy a Microsoft project in it for free. And a whole bunch of other programs like that as well. And I think manufacturers would flood the market with inferior concepts and lines. So it'd be hard to find the good ones. You're right. It is about quality, but quality is a short-term problem. Right. You know, quality is a short-term problem. Right. In, in the early, t right now, uh, software is holding back 3D printing on the home uh, mm -hmm. level. Uh, there's a real need for better software and uh, and better apps that can do it. By the way, there's Microsoft uh, 8 uh, app for 3D, pr 3D printers. Um, but that's just going to get better over time. And that's why I said uh, early adopters are happy with good enough technology. Uh, and then as, as things evolve, it will get better and better, and people will, more and more people will adopt it as the quality gets better. Yes, sir. Uh, one area that, that good enough, isn't good enough is with the bioprinting that you mentioned, human tissues and organs. Where do you think that's going to go? Well, uh, you know, three, Organovo has kept this human liver alive. It's, I forget how thick it is. It's not very thick for about 40 days. The problem is... 3D printing a, a circulatory system that can bring uh, you know, blood and, uh, and, and oxygen inside because it, if it's too thick, there's no way to get the oxygen and the blood inside so it dies. So, so that's the challenge right now. But they're working on that. And there are universities, there's a lot of universities working on this too. And there are uh, also some private companies that are working in the same area. So I think it's just a matter of time before they develop the product that they're trying to develop. The technology is there, but it's early technology, and, and nobody's going to stop working on it. So to think that they won't eventually get there, I think, is, is, is impractical. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think it, uh, along the lines of what, what we were talking about, um, good enough, I think about the tort lawyers and mm -hmm. where, you know, where the responsibility for making a safe product will reside. Will it, if, you're, if you're printing it in your home, is it buyer beware or maker beware, or will you be able to you know, shift that tort liability to designer or mm -hmm. to the manufacturer? Well, you know, my area is IP. My legal, legal area is IP. Um, but there's a lot of legal areas that have implications from 3D printing. One is product liability, like you mentioned. Another is insurance. And um, uh, the, there are very few IP lawyers out there talking about this. Um, until about three weeks ago, I saw nothing at all from a product liability lawyer. So there's like a, there's a vacuum there that needs to be filled by product liability lawyers. There's a, it's a, it's a fertile area. Uh, and and um, I think you're right. It, 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 those things will have to be worked out by the courts. It, it will be an issue. Uh, you know, if you make a bicycle helmet at home and you fall off your bicycle and you crack your head, uh, well, who are you gonna sue? Maybe nobody. Uh, if you did, the, did it entirely independently on the internet with peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, files that were created by someone out there and you printed it yourself, well, there's nobody to sue, um, except maybe you sue the 3D printer company and you may lose. Who knows though, right? Who knows what a jury's going to do? But imagine if we get to a time when companies are selling designs, not products. So the company that makes the bicycle helmet now is selling a design. And that design, they specify, has to be printed on a certain printer, has to be printed with certain materials, can only maybe be printed by certain companies that are out there who are qualified to do it. So then you have the helmet and it cracks. You can sue all those people. But what if that helmet design gets uh, shared peer to peer and then people just start printing it? And it looks just like the one it's supposed to look like. But how do you know? How do you know it's the one that's printed to the authentic specifications? How do you know? So then you can sue everybody and you try to work those things out. So there's a real, there's a, there's a real potential mess coming in the product liability area uh, and who knows how it'll shake itself out. Yes, sir. You mentioned the peer-to-peer uh, <coughs> -peer and the sharing of the designs and things. But isn't that where the control is? Is the control of the software control of the designs? I mean, it's 
what's going on yep. offer now. I mean, people are winding down you know, these huge patent wars and stuff. Yep. So the question is, isn't software the place to, to, to control it? Well, maybe. But you have to think about scanners. So if you, uh, if you have a good 3D scanner, you can scan anything. You already have this thing. You can scan it. Then you tweak that design, and then you print it. You haven't gotten software any, you haven't gotten, you haven't gotten a file anywhere to do that. You haven't bought any software to do that. You just do it with everything you have right in your house. Okay, so you can, you can scan and 3D print anything eventually. But um, going beyond that, uh, talking about software, there are companies out there that are trying to develop systems to control software. I know one is, one's called Fabulonia. Uh, they think they've got it solved. I, a lot of other people don't think that they have it solved. Uh, but, but I think the, the real chink in the armor is that once that design file gets loose on the internet, then anybody can print it. So the question is, how are you, is it possible through digital rights management to lock a file down so that nobody can open it? No, it's not. Okay. Thank you, so we'll present you a noblest pen. Ah, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.